Welcome everyone. We're going to be looking at reconstruction from 1865 to 1877. And this is correlating with the MSECO chapter 16, I believe, um, and briefly chapter 15. It could be chapter 15 as well. I forgot. Um, but what reconstruction is all about is the South uh, not only physically and politically and and economically reconstructing, but socially as well. There's going to be a lot of problems with that. And we'll get into probably the social reconstruction is going to be the most uh, hardest to achieve. But uh, we'll look at how that was accomplished during this time period. And it actually got started. So reconstruction actually started prior to the war even ending. Uh, the Union, once basically the Battle of Vicksburg happened, and eventually moving towards Gettys Battles of Gettysburg, the Union started seeing that eventually the South was going to succumb to defeat. So they started to plan what was going to happen actually as early as 1863 and 1864, about a year before the war will end. Uh, Link is going to institute his 10% plan. They're going to try to institute it, um, at least start talking about it, putting you know, his plan together. And what that plan was, was basically a very lenient plan. It showed that Lincoln was going to try to incorporate the South back into the Union at the quickest, fastest way possible to get them back incorporated. And that was a 10% plan. Um, never put forth, so we don't know how Congress would have reacted to it. But we can guess that Congress probably would not have liked such a lenient plan because they were built up of very radical Republicans mostly. Their plan was to be a very harsh, punitive plan called the Wade Davis Bill. Um, it did pass on July 2nd, 64, so about a half a year before the war ended, and it was pushed by the radical Republicans. And this was harsh because it pretty much made every Confederate general or leader, leader punished for life. They took away permanent voting rights of all of them. Uh, the new government could have no ex-Confederate leaders or soldiers, and everyone had to create an oath of allegiance, along with creating a new constitution and making sure that you adapt and am uh, the amendment, 13th Amendment. And then again, Lincoln, Lincoln vetoed it. <coughs> Excuse me. And what that signified is that Congress did not override his veto. That showed us that he was, they were willing to work with Lincoln within a more compromisable reconstruction plan. But Lincoln, that never happens. Lincoln gets assassinated by John Wilkes Booth in April 15th, just less than a week after the war ended. Eventually, uh, they'll catch John Wilkes Booth and, and uh, kill him uh, when they, he refuses to come out of a barn that he's uh, trapped inside. Johnson will take over the vice president. And remember, Johnson was put as a vice president to sort of um, appease the southern swing states that were now back in the Union, like for example, like Tennessee and Kentucky and Maryland and Missouri, these states that had either been uh, in a rebellion, like for example, Tennessee, or a states that had came with a union with slaves, they picked Johnson to be Lincoln's running mate to get some support in those states. Um, but he was not a very good pick as a Reconstruction president because, again, he was racist, he had slaves himself at one point, and Congress had no respect for him. So once he uh, got elected and the Congress was in a recess, what he did, he actually pushed forth his own Reconstruction plan without congressional approval. And it was a very lenient one. Um, it basically offered amnesty to every Southerner who took oath of allegiance, including the leaders and soldiers. Um, it appointed provisional governors to Southern states. So again, he would appoint them. So he, he was going to appoint very lenient governors. Um, he made uh, the Confederates repay any debts and pass the 13th Amendment, which are all good stuff. And within months, all states complied because it was very lenient. The problem was that he didn't get congressional approval to do this plan. So Congress will immediately work to revoke this plan and pass their own. And what it shows you is that Congress started early on really not liking Johnson and wanting him out of office as, as in any way possible. Okay, so some things that were set up right at the very start. So first of all, the states of the, of the South were very leery about giving black rights. They had to in these new amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th. However, they will also pass black codes, state codes, to limit the movement and the ability of true freedom for African Americans. And we read a few of these in class as examples. And you see, most of these black codes are really pushing the, the, the freed African American to almost be almost like a slave again. Not actual slavery, but as close as you possibly can without it being slavery. 
uh, the union will set up a Freedmen's Bureau. And again, a organization to help African Americans in the process of becoming freed. Uh, it will help them train for new jobs. It will help them um, look at labor contracts, uh, help them find housing. It will set up uh, freedmen's schools to help educate African American children. And all very good and successful things. The problem with this is that early on, President Johnson hates this. He doesn't like the federal government providing these services for African Americans. So he can't actually kill it. He can't actually get rid of this because it's a congressionally made organization. But what he can do, he can underfund it. So early on, we see that Johnson is going to do everything in his power to sort of take away funds from this Freedmen's Bureau, making it harder and harder for it to operate successfully. So what do these former slaves do? Um, the thought would be they'd be get the hell out of Dodge and all go north. Well, that wasn't the case. Pretty much most African Americans will stay in the exact same location that they were slaves in. They will stay on the same plantation, but instead of being a slave for that, they'll be a, either a tenant or a sharecropping farmer. Um, some will move to the southern cities and get jobs as laborers. Some will move northward and get jobs within the factories. Very few though. And some will move westward to take advantage of the more liberal, more open, less racist west. <clears throat> However, most slaves will become sharecroppers. So make sure you really know this very well. Um, what it was, it, basically the plantation owners needed laborers. So what they did, they broke apart their plantation into several sections, each section being given to a farmer, a former slave or slave family. And it wasn't actually a free piece of land. Basically what they was, it was you can have use it and grow crops on this land. And by doing that, you'd have to pay the, plant, the planter a share of your crop at the end of each season. Um, the planter would provide them with a, um, with a cotton gin and clothing and food and fertilizer and seed. But again, when I say provide, all at cost. Typically, by the end of the year, the, the newly freed slave was actually not ahead economically, but was actually in debt. Usually the cost of the food and the grain and the clothes and the, 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 the use of the cotton gins would add up to actually be more than they could sell their crop for. So that put a lot of former slaves and freedmen back into almost an economic slavery to their planter owners, uh, they're the planters, the former owners. So there's a freedman school. And there's some, again, and you'll see a lot of the people will say that the um, African Americans, their lives change very little between slavery and not slavery. Again, their day-to-day -day lives. Yes, there's going to be less abuse, um, but there's still lots of restrictions and lots of laws and lots of limits to their rights as well. Um, and their daily lives is going to be picking in the fields for the most part. And you see here, most of the share crops are in those deep south areas where we see the um, huge amounts of cotton plantations. And what we see, we see before sharecropping during slavery, you had the big house where the master lived and all the plantation lands and their slave quarters. Well, what they did, they basically had the same plantation and they just would put a slave family in their own little house across the plantation. Okay, Congress develops its own plan for reconstruction. So the Congress will not take Johnson's plan. They are gonna um, basically create their own plan starting with a new, a new law called the Civil Rights Act. Um, what the Civil Rights Act does, it actually will set up the 14th Amendment. Um, and this act will give rights to blacks and grant citizenship to all people except you know, Native Americans. Um, and Johnson immediately will veto this. But Congress has the majority of Republicans. And so they are able to override his veto. So Johnson will be more veto, more veto hungry or more veto powerful than Jackson is actually. But unlike Jackson, Congress is made up of mostly Republicans. So therefore, those Republicans in Congress are able to override most of Johnson's vetoes that he'll pass. Okay, the 14th Amendment came out of the Civil Rights Act. And what it did, it granted citizenship to all persons born in the U.S. or are naturalized in the U.S. 
and basically says that we cannot take away anyone's life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So basically, it allows all Americans to be seen in the Constitution as equal. Again, there is going to be some stipulations against Native Americans. We're going to still see Native Americans sort of lagging behind right-wise. Uh, but again, at least in the eyes of the Constitution, we see that, that the Constitution allows for equality. It doesn't mean that there's going to actually be true equality, and the states are going to do, do a lot to undermine it. But in reality, constitution-wise, legality-wise, um, you know, enumerated power-wise, blacks are now equal to rights constitutionally. Let me see that. And then uh, that same year, they're going to pass the official Reconstruction Act of 1867. Um, and this is where our debate comes up. A lot of people wanted in this act to include the confiscation of land to be redistributed to blacks. That never does happen. But what they do do, they are going to reorganize the South into conquered lands being controlled by the military. There's going to be five sections that are going to be controlled militarily by Union generals. Um, to get out of military rule, what a state needs to do is, one, craft a new state constitution without without slavery and with blacks allowing to vote. So you must allow blacks to have suffrage in these new governments. Also, every state must ratify the 14th Amendment prior to coming back in the Union. So until a state does it, they do not have the power to cast ballots in national elections. And here are the five military districts. You're going to have basically you have Virginia, North Carolina, the Carolinas, Florida and the Deep South, Arkansas and Mississippi, and then Texas, Louisiana. And you see Tennessee comes back in the Union really early, so they almost don't have any military reconstruction whatsoever. Uh, just about a year, and that's it, or you know, just that, that's it. Okay, now we get into a little tricky part. Congress doesn't like Johnson, the president, and they need to figure out a way for him to break the law so they can impeach him. And this is what the whole basis of this act is. The Tenure of Office Act was basically a ploy by Congress to get Johnson to break a law so they can legally start impeachment trials. So what this act did, it required the Senate consent to remove any official appointed by the Senate. So any, like, um, for example, all cabinet members have to be up, uh, basically approved by the Senate. They're appointed by the president, but approved by the Senate. Meaning that if Johnson wants to get rid of a cabinet member, he must get congressional approval first. And the reason they did that is because they knew that Johnson really wanted to get rid of this the Secretary of War, Edward Stanton. He hated him. Um, and so they put him into a situation that, that he was bound to break. It was, it was a setup, you could say. <clears throat> so what happens is that in 1867, Andrew Johnson suspends Stanton and replaces him with Ulysses S. Grant. The Senate will overrule him and Grant will resign. And the uh, Stanton will still become, or still Secretary of War. And at that point, Stanton will officially remove, or get removed by Johnson. Once that happens, so once Johnson officially dismisses Stanton, he now has broke the law because, again, he never got Senate approval to do that. At that point, the House of Representatives has every right to then push for an impeachment trial. The House of Representatives, remember, are controlled by radical Republicans in the populous northern states. They easily, easily impeach him. So, um, so basically, Andrew Johnson is the first president to be impeached with the Tenure of Office Act. Just because you're impeached, it does not mean you're removed from office. For example, uh, we've had three presidents impeached in our history. We've had Johnson, Clinton, and Trump. All of them stayed in power after they were impeached. The reason why is that the House just impeaches a president. The Senate is the one that will vote for removal. Okay, the Senate will, will vote for removal. In this case, Basically, the Senate was one vote shy of the two-thirds majority needed. The reason why some of these radical Republicans did not vote for impeachment is they did not want to set precedent of why he was impeached in the first place. Remember, Johnson was an unlike dude. 
but he wasn't a corrupt criminal. Okay, he uh, he basically violated this act because it was set up. That was set up just for him to violate. Uh, it wasn't a, like a real law that was that was the core root of our constitution or our country. Remember, Congress made this law to set him up, and Congress saw the writing of the law. The thought was. If the radical Republicans could, could do this to Johnson, what's to stop the other side when they take power eventually to do it to the Republicans? So there was a lot of precedent set that you, we don't just remove a president because we don't like his policies. He has to have done something truly wrong to for removal. Okay, in 1868, we see a basically Johnson not run. He had no chance to win the Republican ticket. So they nominated Ulysses S. Grant, a war general, as the main ticket holder against the Democrat, Seymour. And you see that Grant's going to easily win both the popular and electoral vote. And you see there's still three states that were unable to vote, Virginia, Mississippi, and Texas, because they were not yet reconstructed constitutionally. And you also see those several states, you see Florida and Alabama and Arkansas and Tennessee, these other states all voting Republican. What that shows us is that probably in those states, you have a large percentage of African Americans for the first time voting, and of course, African Americans are voting Republican. In 1870, Congress is gonna pass the third Reconstruction Civil War Amendment called the 15th Amendment. And that will allow all males to vote. Again, it doesn't allow women to vote, but it allows all males to vote. The South, though, will do things to still obstruct African Americans from voting, like creating poll tax where you have to pay to vote, or creating literacy tests, meaning that you have to pass a literacy test to be able to vote, to be able to read and write. And there's that right there. And of course, women were pissed off, so they formed another union called the National Women's Suffrage Association, headed by Caddy Stanton from Seneca Falls and Susan B. Anthony. And they're going to really sort of start spreading the word around the country, trying to advocate for women getting the vote on the national election. So as the military reconstruction happened, we're going to see more and more Republicans control the Southern politics. Um, and that's because there was protection down there by the military. Um, in some cases, some uh, Republicans will move down to the South to take advantage of these newly opened governments for them. And some of them, of the uh, people that will run will actually be from the South who sort of turn on the Democratic Party and switch to Republican. Also, you're gonna see a lot of African Americans starting to take their role in politics for a short amount of time before they're gonna be banned. Okay. Carpetbaggers and scallywags. A carpetbagger is a name for a radical Republican that moves down south, excuse me, to take a role in the new government. In many cases, these people were corrupt. They were wanting to go down there to graft, to take bribes, to, to make money off the reconstruction process of the south. Carpetbaggers. A scallywag is a southern white person who is probably a formerly Democrat who turned Republican to take advantage of the new government that was in place. And then you have African Americans uh, who will start going to power and, and, and running for politics. You're gonna have several African Americans become mayors, representatives, some governors, one I think it was, and, and then you have a couple representatives and senators. So for a short time, you see a flood of African Americans getting into politics, and again, you can equate that to what do African Americans now have the right to do is vote. So that direct vote equates in African Americans actually in government positions. Again, this is gonna be short lived because once the military leaves the South and the South sort of like gets returned back to the white rule, they're gonna immediately do things to sort of make it extremely hard for blacks to vote. Thus, you're gonna see, you know, you're gonna see black senators and black representatives and black mayors and black governors, but then you're going to see them all leave and be voted out of office by the 1870s. And we're not going to have any of those back until, again, the 1960s. So for about 100 years, we're going to see the repression of black rights in the South. Okay, undoing Reconstruction. 
So Reconstruction has a lot of successful things. You have the Freedmen's Bureau, you had blacks now getting uh, you know, new opportunities with, with economic opportunities and employment. You had blacks voting for the first time. You had three constitutional amendments, Indian slavery and um, protecting uh, people's civil rights and voting rights, all really good things. But the South is gonna try to undermine that. They're gonna try to undo that. First, by hate, by hate tactics, by, by threatening African Americans for taking their rights. So the KKK formed uh, as a white social club that early morphed into a hate club. And uh, KKK is still around today. And um, what their sort of job was is to terrorize African Americans so African Americans wouldn't want to take their rights. And they wore sheets, and even their horses did, and they did cross burnings and lynchings and just intimidation. They burned schoolhouses. And here we see a donkey, which represents the Democratic Party, the KKK. And you see two white people hanging from the tree. You see a person from Ohio with a carpet bag. And you see another white person who is probably going to be a scallywag, a, a turncoat, who now will basically ex accept and support the blacks and the Republican Party. So what Grant does to combat the rise of the KKK is actually pass the KKK Act, or the Ku Klux Klan Act in 71. And it was actually a good law, but it had very little enforcement. It, what it did, it authorized the president to enforce uh, the, the laws and the protection of blacks using federal troops. But it's not a really very strong act, because what it does, it uh, basically allows, I'm sorry, how would I put this? Okay, the 14th Amendment uh, makes it so that every single state institution would have to treat blacks equally. What it doesn't do is say that individuals have to treat blacks equally. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, you know, things about you know, threatening and so a state can't, uh, you know, can't be biased or um, discriminatory to blacks, but a person could be. And also very few papers were arrested for privy time because most of the people that uh, or all the judges were white and all the juries were white. So even though they may have been arrested or convicted, they arrested, they were not convicted because of the court and judicial system. Here's one example of the Supreme Court sort of uh, pushing back on black rights. So in 1873, we had already had the 14th Amendment that says that blacks had to get equal rights. So what happened is several slaughterhouses are going to sue, saying that they have the right to not give equal rights to African Americans and not hire African Americans. So the Supreme Court ruled that citizens' privileges and Im immunities as protected by the Constitution of the 14th Amendment against the states were limited to those spelled out in the Constitution and did not include many rights given to the individual states. And what this did in a nutshell, what you, you know for the class, is that it limited the amount of rights that were protected under the 14th. So it allowed Southern whites to do more things to discriminate legally against African Americans. And the North starts to lose faith. Uh, we start seeing the North is like it's a, it's a war zone, it's costing lots of money, and the North are starting to like say, hey, we want to like stop our military being in the South, we want to stop paying for this, you know, South, it's reconstructed enough. Also, we're going to start seeing racist propaganda coming northward. Uh, and we also see um, the more radical Republicans who are in Congress start to either get voted out of office or retire. And we start seeing more liberal Republicans who are wanting to end Reconstruction. Also, Grant has a lot of scandal in his presidency. We're going to see the whiskey ring scandal, um, where Grant will basically appoint his buddies to positions of power, and those buddies will then um, basically receive bribes and will filter money out of the whiskey tax into Republican accounts. So even though Grant wasn't personally involved in this whiskey ring, he, his reputation and his presence will be sort of soiled as a very corrupt Republican president. Another one was the Credit Mobilier scandal, where his um, People with this government is going to basically get bribes and kickbacks from railroad companies for giving them um, land and contracts to build the transcontinental 
and um, different types of cross-country railways. So two different scandals that both tarnished his presidency. Okay, after, four, or after two terms and eight years of grant, we're going to see a new election of 1876. In this election, we see Hayes, the Republican, run against Tilden, the Democrat. Closest election of all time, one electoral vote will separate them. What happens that makes it controversial is we see Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina all send in two sets of electoral votes. Um, it was such a close battle in those three states that both sides say that they're the ones who should be legitimized. So they both send in their votes. The um, issue goes to the House representative, who is actually controlled by the Republicans. And the Republicans, in a compromise, give Hayes a victory, 8 to 7. So one part of the compromise um, is that Democrats, let me see where I am, yeah, Democrats protest election that Hayes had threatened to hold up the inauguration. So what the Republicans give the Democrats is basically taking out federal troops of all the last states. So taking out federal troops from Texas, Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina. And they do that, thus ending reconstructional rule. And we see here uh, a lot of the Republicans thought this was going on, basically. Yes, blacks were voting. That's why Democrats actually got some vote. But they're being manipulated at the polls. Okay, the legacy of Reconstruction. Um, some real achievements were being made we'll talk about during class on Friday. Uh, overall, though, Reconstruction was mostly a failure um, for several reasons. One, it will split party politics. We're going to see a big north-south split, Democrats in the south, Republicans in the north. We're going to see that even after the Civil War, we're going to be a very divided country. Um, Politicians don't want to infringe on states' rights, so they're not going to really, really stop states from passing poll taxes and literacy tests and black coats. Um, the thought was there's going to be also no distribution of property. Uh, and the reason why is the Northerners were fearful that they would expand the government rights. And there's still going to be a belief that blacks are inferior to whites, so that social reconstruction is going to be a mold and failure. You also will see the New South really trying hard to get back to the democratic rule. These are called redeemers, a new group of powerful Democrats that are wanting to sort of return African-Americans as a lower status. Um, and they're going to be really pushing for the South to stay the South. Uh, this is where uh, we're going to start seeing statues being made to sort of honor these Confederate soldiers in the Civil War. And we'll talk about why that happened tomorrow during class as well. You're going to see a slow development of southern railways and southern transportation, southern industry. But still, there's going to be very few opportunities outside of farming for African Americans. So very little economic opportunity. And the last little bit is the social part. Blacks in the South. Uh, we're going to see African Americans still take a backseat economically and socially and politically. Uh, we have this guy, Booker T. Washington. He's going to say that American blacks should not fight for equality through the political system. What they should do is learn a trade, fight for economic equality. And with economic equality will come then more rights. So the thought is learn a trade, learn how to be a technician or a plumber or a carpenter or a craftsman. Then that will give you more economic freedom and economic ability. This is called his Atlanta Compromise, that he is compromising the rights of blacks now for the future of rights for blacks later. And uh, again, there's a lot of controversy about this, this, that. Also, we're going to see the birth of Jim Crow laws, where states are going to actively try to target blacks and facilities by removing blacks from all white facilities. This whole aspect of segregation is called. Um, what solidifies this is the court case Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, where the Supreme Court will rule against a black person about riding on a white train. Uh, the thought was is that he should be able to, right, because it's his right. But the court case says that, well, this train company provided an all-black car. So since they provided two cars, a white car and a black car, black people must separate if there is equal facilities available to them. Okay. In reality, though, of course, we know that equal facilities were not available to blacks. You see there's drinking fountains are different, you know, theaters are different. <clears throat> You know, waiting rooms and colored, you know, are different. 
A couple other things also, we're gonna see whites habitually take away blacks' voting rights by not taking them away, but disenfranchising them, meaning restrict them, include poll taxes and literacy tests to make it harder to vote, but include a grandfather clause to make it easy for whites to vote. What grandfather clause is, is allows any white person that has a relative of a vote in the past to not have to pay poll taxes or literacy tests. And the last thing is gonna be lynching, just this pure fear factor, this mob killing or mob beatings, um, where it was legal to lynch people in the South back then. Again, one person could um, be committed for a crime, but that whole mob of people would be not culpable for any type of arrest or illegality. Um, it, again, it was a way that whites could control the freedoms that blacks now had. Okay, so there is our lecture. Um, we'll have lots of questions for tomorrow, so let's write some, write about five questions down, and let's ask them during lecture and class tomorrow. Have a great day, guys.